Hello, I'm JP from the Way Biblical Fellowship, and this week's Torah portion is called Via Shlak. Um, it goes from just after uh, Yaakov has left Lavan, um, just before he meets with his brother um, Esav for the first time in 20 years. Um, and we go through another 20 years of Yaakov's life. Um, his sojourn in Shechem, which didn't end so well, um, and his eventual journey to Betel with his family. Um, and then we go a little bit into the genealogies of Yaakov and Esav and see what we can learn. Hope you enjoy it. Torah portion is via Shlak. Okay, you'll notice that a lot of the Torah portions begin with this. They begin with uh, the V sound, it just means and. And the Y sound means he. Okay, so and he did this and that. That's what all the Torah portions are called. Okay, so via Shlak can either mean and he reached out or and he sent forth. And we've got examples of that the first time that this verb is used in Genesis 3. Okay, in verse 22, it says, And Yehovah God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand, reaches out, and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, Yehovah God sent him forth. Okay, so we've got the two meanings there. So, over the past two, three weeks, this is what we've learned, this is what we've seen. Over 20 years ago, Yaakov deceived his brother, okay, deceived um, Esav. As a result, Esav had expressed his intent to kill him, okay. Yaakov fled to the country of his mother, Haran, to live with her brother, Levan. There he was made to be the victim of deception involving the rights of the firstborn. So he reaped what he sowed. Basically, he uh, deceived his father about being the firstborn. And then when he gets there, he finds a woman that he falls in love with. And uh, Levan says, okay, you can take her as your wife. Um, you've just got to work for me for seven years. And after seven years, um, he gave him the firstborn instead and said it's not done so in our country to give uh, the secondborn after the firstborn so he reaped what he sowed he saw immediately that that's the way that things should have done been done where he came from so many of the lessons that Yaakov learned in Haran came as a result of being the victim of Levan's deceit okay all the way through the story of Yaakov we see that the fruit of what he's sown is what he reaps Yaakov is now forced to face his fear of Esav by returning to the land of his birth. Okay, that's what he's told to do. Now, 20 years later, he's got to go back and face his brother. Okay, this situation hasn't been rectified at all. It's all up in the air, he just ran away. Genesis 28, 15 says, And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I sh have spoken to thee of. So this is what Yehovah says to Yaakov when he's at Betel the first time. But this was 20 years ago. I doubt very much that Yaakov remembers this promise that was made to him. Sometimes God will say something to us. He'll reassure us about something and we won't remember it the next week, a month later. Okay, this is 20 years later. Imagine what was happening in your life 20 years ago. Put yourself in that position and think, if God said something to me then, would I remember it? So Yaakov had to have many questions. These are certainly questions that I'd have anyway. What will he find when he gets home? Okay, as I say, 20 years have passed. So he's gone and he's lived another 20 years of his life. The situation, it, it's not like he can just ring home and find out what's going on there. He doesn't, he doesn't know what the situation is at all. Uh, Yitzhak and Rivka are still alive. Okay. Has his father forgiven him for what he did? 
Okay, as I said, he just left. He's got no way of knowing at all. He's no, no contact with his father. Are they still living in Be'er or have they had to move on? He doesn't even know when he gets home that they'll still actually be in the place where he left them. Does Asav still want to kill him? This has got to be primary on his mind, really, hasn't it? And what will life be like for him when he returns home? Put yourself in his actual position and think what it would be like if you were Yaakov and you had to return home and you had to discover how things were. This leads us to some questions. In order to do that, in order to put ourselves in that position, there's some questions that we can ask. Have you ever truly feared any other human being? They truly feared them. We've all had things in our life that we have truly feared, that we've been fearful of, that we've been scared of. Have you ever known for sure that another human being has not only the desire, but also the power to take your life? Okay, I've been in this position. We've all been in the position though, where we know that there is an outcome that could be bad for us. We know that it is a likelihood or we know that it's something that could happen anyway. Have you ever had to make a journey who uh, you knew could very likely end in your falling into the power of angry men who hate you and have sworn to kill you? Okay, as I say, we've all been in a position, if not this exact position, but where we know that something bad could happen to us. Okay, it's a, it's a possibility uh, in a situation where basically we are at the mercy of something else, circumstances beyond our control. Okay, so the Pasha starts in Genesis 32, verse 3. Then Yaakov sent messengers before him to his brother Asav in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He also commanded them, saying, Thus you shall say to my lord Asav, Thus says your servant Yaakov, I have sojourned with Levan and stayed until now. I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants, and I have sent them to tell my lord that I may find favor in your sight. The messengers returned to Yaakov, saying, We came to your brother Asav, and furthermore, he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. It doesn't bode well, does it? Okay, if you, the word that comes back is, yeah, he's coming to meet you, and there's 400 guys with him. Okay, what's going to be going through your head isn't, oh, he's, he's probably got a massive welcome party for me. He's, if you think that it's a possibility that he's going to kill you, when you hear that he's on his way with an army, it's going to be fairly terrifying. Now this word here, messengers, Okay, in the Hebrew, it's malachim. Okay, could be messengers, it could be angels. A couple of verses before this, he's just met with the angels of God, and it says that he, he sends messengers or angels before him to speak to Asaph. So, I don't know. Both of them are likely in this, in this case. Could be angels, could be just sending human messengers before him, but that's a possibility. Then Yaakov was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people who were with him, and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. For he said, if Asav comes to the one company and attacks it, then the company which is left will escape. Imagine being in that position where you had to divide the people who were with you into two groups, one who was more likely to die and one group that could escape. And it's a very real reality for him. Yaakov said, O oh, Elohim of my father Abraham and Elohim of my father Yitzhak, O oh, Yahuwah, who sent to, uh, said to me, return to your country and to your relatives and I will prosper you. I am unworthy of all their loving kindness and of the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. For with my staff only, I crossed this Jordan. And now I have become two companies. Okay, just before this, he arrives at a place and he calls it Manachim, which means two camps. And could either be talking about, he's just met with Laban at this point, or it could be prophetic, or the fact that he knows that he's going to meet Esau at this point. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Asav, for I fear him that he will come and attack me and the mothers with the children. For you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. So he spent the night there. Then he selected from what he had with him a present for his brother Asaph, 
200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams. Okay, I want you to, to remember 200 ewes. Okay, there's a flock of sheep that's mentioned there. 30 milking camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He delivered them into the hand of his servants. Every drove by itself and said to his servants, pass on before me and put a space between the droves. He commanded the one in front saying, when my brother Asav meet you and ask you saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going? And to whom do these animals in front of you belong? Then you shall say, these belong to your servant Yaakov. It is a present sent to my Lord Asav and behold, he also is behind us. Okay, so this language as well, to whom do you belong? Okay, what the, um, the sages have drawn a comparison between this account and the one that we heard last week, where Yaakov arrives at the well, um, he finds the shepherds there, they're there with the two groups of sheep, they're waiting for the third group of sheep to come along, and he says, from whence art thou? Okay, similar language to what is used here. The two accounts have very similar um, instances that happen in them. Then he commanded also the second and third, okay, so now there's not one group of sheep, there's three groups of sheep. And all those who drove the, uh, followed the droves, saying, after this manner shall you speak to Asaph when you find him. And you shall say, behold your servant Jacob also is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. Then afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on before him while he himself spent the night in the camp. Now he arose that same night and took his two wives and two maids and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Yabok. He took them and sent them across the stream and he sent across whatever he had. Okay, so at this point, he's crossing the stream. There's an army right in front of him and now he's making a crossing across water. He's just prayed to God. This is a massive act of faith. He doesn't wait on the other side for Asaph to come across in case he needs to fight him. He crosses the stream, puts his life in the hands of God. Then Yaakov was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. A lot of the time when it says a man, it says Ish in the Hebrew, it's talking about an angel. We'll see next week in next week's Torah portion when uh, Yaakov goes to um, find his brothers, he meets an Ish and it's thought to be an angel. But we'll see as the encounter goes on that this is indeed an angel. When he saw that he had not prevailed against them, he touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Yaakov's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Okay, so this is Yaakov. The angel is basically saying, look, I've got other things that I need to be getting on with at the moment. Just let me go. This is pointless. And Yaakov is holding on to him and asking him for the blessing. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, the Yaakov. He said, your name shall no longer be Yaakov, but Yisrael, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Yaakov asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So this reminds me of another thing that we see in the Tanakh. He's asking the angel what his name is. The angel is refusing to give him his name. And when we see Manoah, okay, Manoah is Samson's dad. When the angel of Yehovah appears uh, to Samson's mum, Manoah says, what was the angel's name? She says, I don't know. So when the angel appears again, this is what happens. And Manoah said unto the angel of Yehovah, what is thy name that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? And the angel of Yehovah said unto him, why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? So I really don't know what's actually happening here. The angel saying his name is secret. This angel um, that's being asked by Yaakov what his name is, doesn't give him his name. Could it be something to do with the fact that your name is your function, what you do? So the angels of God will not give their names because it would reveal too much. I'm not sure what's going on. So Yaakov named the place uh, Peniel. For he said, I have seen Elohim face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose, up, uh, rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel. Okay, Peniel's the place, Penuel is the river. And he was limping on his thigh. 
Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Yaakov's thigh and the sinew of the hip. There's some sex today that will not uh, eat that meat. Then Yaakov lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, Asaph was coming, and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids and the children in front and Leah and her children next and Rachel and Yosef last. Okay, that's got to have been a pretty awkward situation, hasn't it? Dividing the people up. Any reason why uh, we're going in the front? <sighs> nope, no. But he's, he's honorable at least, he says. Uh, he himself passes on ahead of them and bowed down to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother Okay, so he prostrates himself seven times as he's getting closer and closer to his brother. He prostrates himself before him. He shows deference to him. Then Asav ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Okay, this is another element that is very similar to what we saw in the Parsha last week. Okay, kissed him and they wept. When the sages look at the account of Yaakov, they say, what's he doing kissing this woman? There's something strange here. There's something that we're not understanding. So they link it to this account. They also say that he had a prophetic vision of the fact that his time with Raquel wouldn't be very long. Okay, I don't think that's the case. I think it links it with this. He lifted his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, who are these with you? Okay, again, similar language to the, from whence art thou? So he said, the children whom Elohim has graciously given your servant. Then the maids came near with their children and they bowed down. They I likewise came near with their children and they bowed down. And afterwards, Yosef came near with Rachel and they bowed down. And he said, what do you mean by all this company which I have met? And he said, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. Okay, so we've got five instances here, the similar language. Uh, Yaakov coming close. Rachel coming close, kissed her and he wept. Um, who, who are these with you from whence art thou? Okay, so this very much links it to the last account that we read. For Esau said, I have plenty, my brother. Let what you have be your own. And it's not clear from this whether he's saying pridefully, no, I've got plenty. I don't want anything of yours. Or whether he's being gracious. Yaakov said, No, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then take my present from my hand, for I see your face as one sees the face of God, and you have received me favorably. Okay? I see your face as one sees the face of God. That's a pretty strange thing for him to be saying at this point. Hey, perhaps faces are on his mind for a reason. We see faces mentioned all the way through the Hebrew text. You might, you might notice that faces mentioned quite a lot in the English text. But in the Hebrew, when it says then, Yaakov sent messages before him. It says literally in the Hebrew, before his face. Genesis 32, 20, he's got a lot of instances of it. I will appease him, literally cover the anger from his face with the present that goes before me, before my face. Then afterward, I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me or literally lift up my face. Verse 30, Peniel means the face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Okay, in Genesis 27, 21 to 22, we see the account of uh, Yaakov coming to Yitzhak and um, deceiving him so that he receives the blessing. And Yitzhak said to Yaakov, come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son, Asav or not. And Yaakov went near unto Yitzhak, his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is Yaakov's voice, but the hands are the hands of Asav. Okay, so he hears his voice, okay, feels his hands. The way that he is deceived is because he doesn't see his face. Okay, so that's one possibility of why face comes up a lot. Another possibility is it's something to do with this because he says that it's the, his face is like the face of God. James 1, 22 to 25 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. 
That's what scripture is, okay? It's a mirror so that we see our face and so that we can see what the face of God looks like and we can compare the two and we can correct any deficiencies. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. For whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, being, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. This tells us that all those people who go to church on a Sunday and they sit there, they listen to a sermon and then they'll go home and not incorporate into his lives tells us here that they're deceiving themselves. For Asaph said, I have plenty, my brother. Let what you have be your own. Yaakov said, No, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then take my present. Notice the use of the word present here all the way through. It's present up till now from my hand. I see your face as one sees the face of God and you have received me favorably. Please take my, okay, the word changes here to gift and it's different words in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, the word is bracha, okay, it's blessing. Okay, he's saying to him, please take my blessing, the blessing that I've stolen from you, which has been brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have plenty. Thus he urged them and he took it. So, this is the blessing that Yitzhak gave to Yaakov that he, he stole off Esau. Therefore, Elohim give thee of the dew of heaven, the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. So, in a very real way, Yaakov is giving the blessing back to Esau. He comes near to him and he's bowing and he's calling him Lord and he's giving him um, the material blessings that he's got. So in a very real way, he's saying, take this, this is yours. It's not mine. I shouldn't, should have never taken it. Then Esau said, let us take our journey and go and I will go before you. For he said to him, my Lord knows that the children are frail and that the flocks and herds which are nursing are occur to me. And if they are driven hard one day, all the flocks will die. What Yaakov is saying to him at the moment is true, but it seems to me that he doesn't want to go with Asaph. Okay, Asaph's saying, come with me. And Yaakov's full of excuses at this point. Goes on and says, please let my Lord pass on before his servant and I will proceed at my leisure according to the pace of the cattle that are before me. And according to the pace of the children, until I come to my Lord at Seir, okay, he says that he's going to go and meet him at Seir, but he never goes there. That's a, an unfulfilled promise of Yaakov. Now, Seir is in Botswana, okay, it's in um, the Yarden, it's in Jordan. So, this will be fulfilled when Yaakov returns, when Israel return to. Uh, Adam, Edom. Asaph said, please let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. Okay, so Asaph won't let it go. He's saying, okay, if, if you won't come with me directly, let me leave some of my men with you. And Yaakov says, no, no, you know, there's no need for it. So there's still a little bit of hostility between them. So Asaph returned that day on his way to Seir. Yaakov journeyed to Sukkoth and built him himself a house and made booths for the livestock. Therefore, the place is named Sukkoth. Now, Yaakov came si uh, safely to the city of Shechem, uh, which is in the land of uh, Canaan, which, when he came from Padan Aram and camped before the city. So this is where Yaakov actually goes. He says, yeah, I'll come, I'll come and meet you at Seir. This is where he actually goes. Now, Seir is this sort of region, Mount Seir, there's the eagle's head and the eagle's wings. That's Peniel there, near to where they met. What Yaakov does is he goes west, he goes to Sukkoth, and then he goes even further west to Shechem. He had no intention whatsoever of meeting Esau, it would appear. Uh, he bought the, the piece of land where he pitched his tent from the hands of the son of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Okay, now this is quite controversial. People will say, well, because this is in uh, the West Bank. Okay, so this is obviously a hotly contested area. Some people will say, well, he should have never bought the land. 
yeah, well, I promised the land to him, and by buying it, what you're really doing is you're acceding to the right of ownership of the land, and so that's what's caused the problem. And some people would say, well, the Palestinians are the real children of Yehuda, um, so that's the area of the land that they still occupy. Then he erected there an altar and called it El Elohe Yisrael, okay, the God of, the God of Israel. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Yaakov, went out to visit the daughters of the land. Now, when they go to dwell in Shechem, when we read it, it seems like this is a brief thing that happens. They're just there uh, for a short amount of time. They're actually there for 20 years. Okay, so the period of time that Yaakov is dwelt in Levan's household is the same period of time that they dwell there. Well, uh, Dina goes out to visit the daughters of the land, so she becomes integrated into the culture. They're no longer a set-apart people. They go to live in Shechem, and what we will see is that there are dire consequences to that. When Shechem, the son of uh, Hamor, the Chivi, the prince of the land, saw her, he took her and lay with her by force. He was deeply attracted to Dina, the daughter of Yaakov, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. And something that doesn't tally up, does it? He spoke tenderly to her, he loved her, and he raped her. I'm really not sure what is going on there. It doesn't seem to make sense to me. Perhaps it's something linguistic. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, get me this young girl for a wife. Now Yaakov heard that he had defiled Dina, his daughter, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Yaakov kept silent until they came in. Uh, then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Yaakov to speak with him. Now the sons of Yaakov came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and they were very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Yisrael by lying with Yaakov's daughter. For such a thing ought not to be done. But Hamor spoke with them saying, the, son, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Intermarry with us, give your daughters to us, and take our daughters for yourselves. And though she shall live with us, and the land shall be open before you, live and trade in it, and acquire property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, If I find favor in your sight, then I will give you whatever you say to me. Ask me ever so much bridal payment and gift, and I will give according um, as, you say to, uh, as you say to me. But give me the girl in marriage. So basically what he's saying is, for the dowry, I'll give you a blank check. Whatever you want, that's what I'll pay you. But Yaakov's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor with deceit because he had defiled Dina, their sister. They said to him, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition we will consent to you. If you will become like us, in that every male of you be circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters for, your, for ourselves, and we will live with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and go. Now their words seemed reasonable to Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. The young man did not delay to do the thing because he was delighted with Yaakov's daughter. Now he was more respected than all the household of his father. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are friendly with us. Therefore, let them live in the land and trade in it, for behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters in marriage and give our daughters to them. Only on this condition will the men consent to us to live with us, to become one people, that every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock and their property and all their animals be ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will live with us. All who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and to his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised who went out of the gate of his city. Now it came about on the third day, when they were in pain, the two of uh, Yaakov's sons, Shimon and Levi, uh, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came upon the city unawares and killed every male. Okay, so they said to them, Okay, we'll take your daughters, you take our daughters, one condition, that you get circumcised. They all got circumcised, and they go into the city, and they killed them all. Then Hamor and his son Shechem, with the edge of the sword, 
Uh, they killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword and took Dina from Shechem's house and went forth. Yaakov's sons came upon the slain and looted the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds and their donkeys and that which was in the city and that which was in the field. And they captured and looted all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives, even all that was in the houses. And then Yaakov said to Shimon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the uh, Kenani and the Perizzi. And, men, and my men being few in number, they will, gather the, uh, they will gather together against me and attack me, and I will be destroyed, I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister as a harlot? Okay, so you would think what's going on here is something that Yahuwah would not approve of in any circumstances, okay, going in and killing all of the city. But this is actually very, very similar to something that is prescribed. Their motive for doing it is not similar to what is prescribed. We see in uh, verse 20 and 21, it says, And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came unto the gate of their city and communed with the men of the city, saying, These men are peaceable with us. Therefore, let, us dwell, uh, let them dwell in the land and trade therein. For the land, behold, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters for us. Uh, to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters. Okay, so goes to the gate of the city, and he's convincing them of something. In Deuteronomy 13, 13, we see it says, Certain men, the children of Belial, have gone out from among you, and have withdrawn the inhabitants of the city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. Okay, so you've got people coming to a city and uh, persuading them of something. Okay, not of the same thing, but their motives are different in this case. In verse 7 it says, The sons of Yaakov came out of the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had brought folly in Israel, um, in line with Yaakov's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. Similar to verse 14 of Deuteronomy 13. Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently, and behold, if it be truth and the thing is certain that such an abomination is wrought among you. Okay, same word used there um, in abomination and the thing which ought not be done. Okay, we've only got the English translation, obviously. Verse 25, Genesis 34, it says, And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore, the two of the sons of Yaakov, Shimon and Levi, uh, Dinah's brethren took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. Very similar to Deuteronomy 13:15. What's prescribed is thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly and all that is therein and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. So what Yehovah says to do is for a different motive. He's saying clear out the evil from the land. If they're all going after another God, the city of Israel are going after another God, wipe them out. But you'll see that he says, don't take any spoil. What they did is in their anger at what had been done, they went and took vengeance for themselves and they went, killed everyone in the city and then caught up in the flesh, they went and spoiled the city. What Yehovah says is, you're not doing it for the purposes of your flesh. You're destroying it to wipe it out, wipe out the evil from among you. Genesis 34, 27 to 29 shows where the two accounts differ now. The sons of Yaakov came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their, si their sister. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took their captive and spoiled even, one, even all that was in the house. Okay, this isn't something that they're doing in order to establish Jehovah's righteousness. This is what he says to do. He says, and thou shalt gather all the spoil of it into the midst of the street thereof and shall burn it with fire and all the spoil thereof, every whit for Jehovah thy God and it shall be an heap forever, it shall not be built again. And there shall cleave naught of the cursed thing to thine hand, that Yehovah may turn from the fierceness of his anger, and show thee mercy, and have compassion upon thee, and multiply thee, as he hath sworn unto thy fathers. Okay, so what Yehovah wants done is it just wiped out. We would look at the account of Yaakov's sons, and we would say, 
That's a horrible thing that should never be done. Yehovah has certain things in his law that are there as a deterrent. This didn't happen all of the time, but you can imagine you probably wouldn't go to a city and try and convince them to serve other gods if you thought that this was the punishment. Okay, Genesis 31, 13 says, I am the Elohim of Beit El, house of God, where thou anointest the pillar and where thou vowedest a vow unto me. Now arise, get thee out from this land and return unto the land of thy kindred. This is what uh, Yaakov was told to do before he returned um, to Shechem. Okay. Go back to the land of thy kindred. For him to go and stay in Shechem is a bit like you being somewhere like Germany okay, and being told, go back to the land of your fathers. And instead of coming back to Wirral, you instead go and live in London and say, well, you know, this is, this is England. This is the land of my fathers. No, because he didn't follow the voice of Yehovah, because he didn't do exactly what he'd been told. And he went and did things his own way. These were the consequences. Okay, Yehovah wanted to protect him from these things. And he went in the, the strength of his own will and did it anyway. And this is something that we should bear in mind. Deuteronomy 32, 35. This is what we should do in the, the situation where a sister has been raped, okay? This is what Yehovah says. He says, vengeance is mine and retribution in due time their foot will slip for the calamity, uh, for the day of their calamity is near and the impending things are hastening upon them. If we've got faith in God, then we rely on him to be just, okay? We don't go about doing things ourselves. Now this is a law that is relevant to us at the moment because we're learning who the Edomites really are. Thou shalt not abhor an uh, Adomi, for he is thy brother. So as we're learning about who the Adomi really are, we can't come to a place where we begin to hate them. We, it, it looks to me anyway like they're the Zionists in the land of Israel. But we can't come to a place where we hate them. Okay, we've got to leave vengeance up to Yehovah. Now he tells us, thou shalt not abhor an Adomi, but he equally says this. Um, in Malachi 1, 2 to 3, I have loved you, saith Yehovah, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Yaakov's brother, saith Yehovah, yet I have loved Yaakov, and I hated Esau. So he tells us, don't abhor them. He says, me, myself, I hate them. As I can, because I'm just, I understand everything. And laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Okay. Sorry. I hated, I'd have to read it in the, in the original to see whether it is or if that's just how it's rendered in the English. It seems like prophecies are in the past tense. Yeah, yeah. There's um, there's no tenses as far as I'm aware in in biblical Hebrew. It's just implied by the context. Is that right? Uh, there is, but not in the same way as the modern. So right. Okay. In that sense, usually they will use the past tense with the hover verb at the beginning, which instead of meaning and, it will show that it's actually future. Yeah, and uh, yod being future. Is that right? The verb. The verb being future. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I, <laughs> I'll speak to you in a sec. Okay. <laughs> We're coming to the, the end of this part in a sec. Okay, Joel 3:19 shows what is uh, prophesied to happen to Asa. This is what will, will happen and the reason why. Egypt shall be a desolation and Adom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Yehuda because they have shed innocent blood in their land. Okay, this is why he's got a problem with, the, with Adom because they've shed the innocent blood. Again, it would fit with them being the Zionists. And he says, don't worry about it, okay? Don't hate them, because I'm going to sort this out at the end. Amos 1.11 says, Thus saith Yehovah, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he did pursue his brother with the sword, and did cast off all pity, and his anger did uh, tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever and say that that fits in uh, with them being the Zionists as well. But Yehovah is going to punish these people. We shouldn't be consumed with hate. 
because hate's not something that we are made to endure. Okay, Yahuwah understands and he's just. Let's have a break there. Right, chapter 35. And Elohim said to Yaakov, Arise, go up to Bethel and live there, and make an altar there to Elohim who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Yaakov said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods which are, are among you, and purify yourselves and change your garments. It's quite an interesting instruction, isn't it? That's exactly what we do when we come to Messiah. Put away the foreign gods which are among you. Okay, when we come to Messiah, we've got to put away the image of God that we've got in our heads. Purify yourselves, okay? We know that we do that according to his instructions, his Torah. And change your garments. We're given robes of righteousness to wear. Um, and we're told in Revelation that we can defile those garments. And if we defile them, then our names are blotted out of the book of life. So we've got to keep them keep them clean by washing them in the water of the word. But it's interesting that these people were traveling with Yaakov at this point, okay? They've been with him for ages. And it's just at this point that he tells them, get rid of all of that stuff there. It seems that throughout this Pasha, Yaakov is actually going through a process of repentance. The, he prayed before, it's the first recorded prayer that we have from him and it all seems to be building for some, towards something. He seems, to, um, he seems to be coming to faith throughout the, the course of this Pasha. And let us arise and go over to Bethel and I will make an altar there to Elohim who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. And this phrase here, in the day of my distress, could also be translated in the time of my trouble. So when we read about the end days will be the time of Yaakov's trouble, he actually tells us what's going on in the day of his distress. Okay, this is when Asaph was oppressing Yaakov. That was Yaakov's trouble. That was the time of it. Read about this period in Jeremiah 31 to 11. It says, The word that came to Yirmiyahu from Yahuvah, saying, Thus speaketh Yahuvah, Elohim of Israel, saying, Write to thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith Yahuwah, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Yisrael and Yehudah, saith Yahuwah, and I will cause them to return to the land that I, that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that Yahuwah spake concerning Yisrael and concerning Yehudah. He always used to puzzle me when it said that Yehudah were in captivity, because I thought, no, they, they're just dwelling in the land, aren't they? Uh, recent revelation shows otherwise. For thus saith Yahuwah, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hand of, on his loins, and a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, okay, the day of my distress, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Yaakov's trouble. The word there, trouble, same word for distress. But he shall be saved out of it. So what we're given a picture of here um, is Esav oppressing uh, Yaakov, and Yaakov crying out to God uh, because Esav's there with his army. He's going to kill him. So this is the picture that we have when it says Yaakov's trouble, the time of his trouble is this time that we're talking about in this Pasha. Some people say that it's when he went and stayed in Levan's house, so it'll be a period of 20 years. It's not, Yaakov tells us exactly when it is. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith Yehovah Sevaot, that I will uh, break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. It's a bit strange, isn't it? If it's talking to the children of Yaakov, why is it saying, I will break his yoke from off your neck. Surely we haven't got a yoke on our neck. Well, this is actually a prophecy that was given to Asaph. Okay, back in Genesis 27, 40, uh, Yitzhak, when he's uh, consoling him, he says, And by thy sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion, okay, 
Uh, the Adomi have dominion at the moment that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck so this is actually linking it to this to say that um, Asaph will no longer have the yoke of Yaakov on his neck when he has the dominion which is the time that we're in at the moment um, but they shall serve Yehovah their God and David their king whom I will raise up unto them so it's not talking about um, the Adomi here it's talking about strangers shall no more serve themselves of him but they shall serve Yehovah their God and David their king whom I will raise up unto them so the strangers the Gentiles will be serving Yehovah in this time um, when the Adomi have dominion and they break the yoke from off their necks Therefore, fear thou not, O my servant Yaakov, saith Yehovah, neither be dismayed, O Yisrael, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Yaakov shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. This is Yaakov going back to the land. Okay, don't forget that um, Botra and um, Jordan are part of the land as well. For I am with thee, saith Yehovah, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations with I have scattered thee. So he's going to destroy all of the nations in the time of tribulation. Yet I will not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. So the, the key for us to not see any of the tribulation to be protected from the beginning is to not need correction. Okay, to have our lives exactly in accordance with the word because there, there will be different, um, different uh, grades of people basically the people who go and they're protected from the beginning the people who will go and be protected but they'll see some of the tribulation um, and then the people who have to go through the tribulation because that's the correction that they require um, let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make it an altar there to Elohim who answered, uh, who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Yaakov all the foreign gods which they had and the rings which were in their ears. Okay, nothing wrong with earrings. It's just uh, these would, would have been described, devoted to the foreign gods. And Yaakov hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. As they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them, and they did, uh, they did not pursue the sons of Yaakov. I wonder if that's prophetic, okay, when we are going to the land, whether or not this, I presume that this is a supernatural terror that came upon these people. I don't think that they were scared of Yaakov, but perhaps this is something that we'll see as well when we're protected. So Yaakov came to Lutz, that is Beit El, which is in the land of Kenaan, he and all the people uh, who were with him, he built an altar there and called the place El Beit El, uh, God of the house of God. Because there Elohim had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. And now uh, Deborah, uh, Rivka's nurse died and she was buried below Beit El under the oak. It was named Alon Bakuth. So why are we told this? Why are we told just in the middle of chapter 35, it just interjects and says, Devoah died at this point. We're not even told in all of Torah that Rivka dies. And we're told just randomly here that her nurse died. So what's going on? We're introduced to her, to her nurse in Genesis 24, 59. And they sent away Rivka, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his, man, and his men. So this is uh, when they are in, the, in Rivka's household, um, and she decides that she'll go with them. They send this nurse. Now, in, if you want to find out what a Hebrew word is in the Greek, um, you look at what's called the LXX translation, or the Septuagint translation. Okay, that's a, a Greek translation of the Hebrew text. And this word here is pedagogo. Okay, we see this actually in the native Greek in the New Testament in Galatians 3, 23 to 25. It says, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our pedagogo to bring us unto Messiah that we might be justified by faith. 
But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a paid go go. Now, Yaakov is 110 at this point, but his nursemaid, Rivka's nursemaid, who would look after the children, she's still with him. But this seems to be when Yaakov comes to faith, and then it says that the paid go go died. It's a model of what we see here in the New Testament. Then Elohim appeared to Yaakov again when he came from Padan Aram and he blessed him. Elohim said to him, your name is Yaakov. You shall no longer be called Yaakov, but Yisrael shall be your name. Thus he called him Yisrael. Elohim also said to him, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. This is the first time when uh, Yahuwah refers to himself by this title, El Shaddai. Other people have used this title before, but it's the first time that he says it. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come forth from you. So this term here, a nation and a company of nations, the promise that was given to uh, Abraham has developed over time. It's evolved. When it was first given to him, it says, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Okay, so singular nation, I'll make of you a great nation. Five chapters later, it says, neither shall thy name any more be called Avram, but thy name shall be Avraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. So it's not a great nation anymore, now it's many nations, and you'll notice that this happens when his name is changed as well, just like when Yaakov's name is changed to Israel. He tells him um, something of his destiny. Um, it's un- unveiled progressively. Okay, Yitzhak in Genesis 26, um, Elohim says to him, and I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all of the nations of the earth be blessed. So it's not one nation, it's not many nations, now it's in your seed, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed, which we know happened in the diaspora when um, his people were scattered. Genesis 28 verse 3, and El Shaddai, bless thee, this is Yitzhak talking, and make thee fruitful and multiply thee that thou mayest be a multitude of people. So it's growing again. You yourself, you're not just going to be a nation. You're going to be a multitude of people. And then in this Parsha, we see it says, and uh, Elohim said to him, I am El Shaddai, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be, shall be of thee and kings shall come out of their loins. Now the company of nations, the word there is kahal, okay? Kahal means an assembly. Um, again, going to the Septuagint, kahal is ecclesia in the Greek. In the New Testament, when ecclesia is translated, it's translated as church. When um, a passage is quoted from the Old Testament that's got kahal in it, the word where kahal is is translated as church of nations, okay, of Gentiles, of goyim, okay, I will make of you a church of Gentiles, is what it says. The land which I gave to Abraham and Yitzhak I will give to you, and I will give the land to your descendants after you. Then Elohim went up from him in the place uh, where he had spoken with him. Yaakov set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. So Yaakov named the place where Elohim had spoken with him, Beit El, house of God. Then they journeyed from Beit El, and when there was still some distance to go uh, to Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth, and she suffered severe labor. When she was in severe labor, the midwife said to her, do not fear, for now you have another son. It came about as her soul was departing, for she died, that she named him Benoni, but his father named him uh, Binyamin. Okay, Benoni means son of uh, son of my suffering. Okay, and uh, Binyamin means son of my right hand. Okay, both of them together, picture of the Messiah, obviously. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Beit Lachem, house of bread. Yaakov set up a pillar over her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Okay, so this is, now, finally, now that Binyamin is here, this is Jacob's family complete. Leah, 
she's got six sons. Okay, so actually half of Yisrael is descended from Leah, uh, Zilpah, Rachel, and Bilha. Uh, they've all got two sons each. Okay. Uh, Jacob set, a, set up a pillar over a grave. That is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Yisrael journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Adair. It came about while Yisrael was dwelling in that land that Reuven went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Yisrael heard of it. Now there were 12 sons of Yaakov. Okay, it seems that in the scripture, when it says Yisrael referring to Yaakov, it is uh, when he's operating in the spirit. Okay, when it, it's something that's come up out of his flesh, it refers to him as Yaakov, even though his name's been changed. The sons of Leah and Reuven, uh, Yaakov's firstborn, and Shimon, and Levi, and uh, Yehuda, and Yisachar, and Zebulun. No, Zebulun. Uh, the sons of Rachel, Yosef, and Binyamin, and the sons of Bilhah, uh, Rachel's maid, and Dan, and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maid, uh, Gad, and Asher. These are the sons of Yaakov, who were born to him in Padan Aram. Yaakov came to his father, Yitzhak, at Mamre of Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Yitzhak had sojourned. Now the days of Yitzhak were 180 years. So he was about 170 uh, when Yaakov returned home. So this is a period of 10 years that's just summed up in uh, one verse. Yitzhak breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. An old man of ripe age and his sons Asaph and Yaakov buried him. Now these are the records of the generations of Asaph, that is a dome. Asav uh, took his wives from the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon, the uh, Hivi, or the Chiti, and the Ho uh, Holy Vama, the daughter of Anna, and the granddaughter of Zibion, the Chivi. Also, Bosmat, uh, Yishmael's daughter, the sister of um, Nevi'oth. Ada bore Eliphaz to, uh, to Asav, and Bosmath bore Reuel, and Aholivama bore Yeush, and Yalam, and Korach. These are the sons of Asav who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Asav took his wives, and his sons, and his daughters, and all his household, and his livestock, and his cattle and all his goods were, uh, which he had acquired in the land of Canaan and went to another land away from his brother Yaakov. For their property had become too great for them to live together and the land where they sojourned could not sustain them because of their livestock. So Asav lived in the hill country of Seir. Asav is a dome. These then are the records of the generations of Asav, the father of the uh, Adomi in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Asav's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Asav's wife, Ada, Reuel, the son of Asav's wife, Bosmath. The sons of Eliphaz were Taman, Omar, Zepho, and Getam, and Kanaz. Uh, Timna was a concubine of Asav's son, Eliphaz, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These are the sons of Asav's wife, Ada. These, the, these are the sons of Reuel, Nachath, and Zerach, Sama, and Mizah. These were the sons of Asav's wife, Bosmath. These were the sons of Asav's wife, Aholivama, the daughter of Anna, and the granddaughter of Zibion. She bore to Asav, Yaush, and Yalam, and Korach. These are the chiefs of the sons of Asav, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Asav, or chief Taman, chief Omar, chief Zepho, and chief Kenaz, chief Korach, chief Gatam, chief Amalek. Uh, these are the, are the chiefs descended from Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Ada. These are the sons of Reuel. 
Esav's son, Chief Nachath, uh, Chief Sarach, Chief Sama, Chief Miza. These are the chiefs descended from very well in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Esav's wife, Bozmat. These are the sons of Esav's wife, Aholivama, Chief Yaush, Chief Yalam, Chief Karach. These are the chiefs descended from Esav's wife, Aholivama, the daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Esav, that is Adom, and these are their chiefs. Okay, so, so far we've got this bit of the genealogy, which makes a bit more sense in the visual form. Okay, so Esav has the three wives here, Ada, Aholivama, and Bosmat. Okay, these are their direct offspring, Eliphaz, uh, Aholivama has three offspring, Yehush, Yalam, and Karach, and Bosmat has Reuel. Okay, just so that you can get it into your heads because it doesn't work when someone's just reading it to you. We'll come back to that. And these are the sons of Seir, the Chori, the inhabitants of the land, Lotan and Shobal and Zibion and Anna and Dishon and Eitzah and Dishon. These are the chiefs descended from the Chori, the sons of Seir in the land of Adom. The sons of Lotan were Chori and Hamam, and Lotan's sister was Timna. These are the sons of Shobal, Alvan, and Manachath, and Abal, and Shafo, and Onam. These are the sons of Zibion, Aya, and Anna. He is the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness when he was pasturing the donkeys of his father, Zibion. You know the one. These are the children of Anna, Dishon, and Aholivama, the daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Dishon, Hamda, and Eishban, and Yithran, and Haran. These are the sons of Eitzah, and Bilhan, and Za'avan, and Akan. These are the sons of Dishan, Uts, and Aran. These are the chiefs descended from the Chori, Chief Lotan, Chief Shobal, Chief Zibion, Chief Anna, Chief Dishon, Chief Eitzah, Chief Dishon, these are the chiefs descended from the Chori, according to the various chiefs in the land of Seir. Now these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the sons of Yisrael. Bela, the son of Beor, uh, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was uh, Din Chava. Then Bela died, and Yovav, the son of Zerach, of Botswa, became king in his place. This guy here, okay, Yovav, the son of Zerach. So, is his name familiar, or does it remind you of anyone else's name? Okay, reminds me of Job or Yov. In Job 1, 1 to 3, it says this, this quite possibly is Job. That there was a man in the land of Uts, okay, we heard about Uts, the land is named after this guy, whose name was Eov. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 chiasses and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men in the east. Okay, it says here that uh, Yovav became the king. Now, I don't believe that Eov was the king at the time that this was written, but as we'll see, things changed for him after this account is written. Job 29, 7-9 says this about Eov. When I went out to the gate through the city, when I prepared my seat in the street, so he's an important guy, he's got a seat um, at the gate. The young men saw me and hid themselves, and the aged the rose and stood up. In uh, Torah, we're told that you're meant to stand before the age, but these, these aged people showed deference to him. The princes refrained from talking and laid their hand on their mouth. So the rulers of the land refrained from speaking in his presence. And quite possibly, this was uh, Yovav. Job 42.12 says, So Yehovah blessed, blessed the latter, latter end of Eov more than his beginning. Okay, so all those things that were said about him, that's true 
of when this account was written. Afterwards, he became even greater than he was. So quite possibly, he did become this king. He lived in the right place. He lived, as far as we can tell, around the right time. Um, he certainly matches the description. In Job 1.1, it says, there was a man in the land of Uts, whose name was Eov, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared Elohim and eschewed evil. What do we know about the land of Uts? Lamentations 4.21 says, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Adom, that dwellest in the land of Uts. Okay, so that's where Adom's descendants were. We, we saw that one of his descendants is the namesake of the place. And this guy, Eliphaz, okay, if you remember, one of um, Eov's friends is actually called Eliphaz. So is it possible that this man, from what we know in the text, is in fact Eliphaz? Who's the, the, let me see, he is the brother of Reuel, his grandfather. So he's the brother of uh, Eov's grandfather. In Job 15, 9 to 10, it says, What knowest thou that we know not? What understandest thou which, uh, thou which is not in us? With us are both the gray-haired and the very aged men, much elder than thy father. So this is Eliphaz talking at this point. And he says that he is much elder than Eov's father, who would be Zerach, if this is correct. So that would fit as well. And we're told in Genesis 9, 25 to 26, that uh, Canaan will be the servant of Yehovah Elohim of Shem. What is the one thing that we're told about Eov? That he is his servant. Let's see if that is feasible. So Bosmath, okay? What we told about Bosmath is uh, she would be Eov's great-grandmother, okay? So... We're told this in Genesis 26, 34. And Asaph was 40 years old when he took to wife uh, Yehudith, the son of Beri, the um, Chiti, and Bosmath, the daughter of Elon, the Chiti. Okay, the Chiti, the Hittites, were um, Canaanites, uh, descendants of Canaan. So he would also be a Canaanite. And this is in verse 8 where we're told, a weird thing to say about him to just throw in there it could well be a hint of who he is to people who dig, dig into these things in scripture okay then Yovav died and Husham of the land of the Temani became king in his place then Husham died and Hadad the son of uh, Bedad who defeated Midian in the field of Moab became king in his place and the name of his city was Avith. Then uh, Hadad died, and Samla of Mesrecha uh, became king in his place. Then Samla died, and Shaul of uh, Rechavoth on the U Euphrates River became king in his place. Then Shaul died, and the Baal Hanan, the son of Achbu, became king in his place. Then Baal Hanan, the son of Achbu, died and Hadar became king in his place. And the name of his city was uh, Pa'u and his wife's name was uh, Machetaval, the daughter of Matred, the daughter of uh, Me Zahav. Now these are the names of the chief's descendants from Asav according to their families and their localities, okay? So it says one of them was Uts and according to their localities they were their names. By their names, Chief Timna, Chief Alva, Chief uh, Yethaith, Chief uh, Holivama, Chief Ela, Chief Pinan, Chief Kenaz, Chief Teman, Chief Mivza, Chief Magdiel, Chief Im uh, Iram. Uh, these are the chiefs of Adom, that is Asav in the father of the Adomi according to the habitations in the land of their possession. That's one way to make a list of names more, uh, more entertaining. Have JP read them in Hebrew. Okay, so just before we finish, we'll finish on this slide. The things that we've learned, the things that Jacob's been through in his turning to faith in this Pasha. 
Okay, we saw at the river Yabok, Yaakov wrestled with an angel and was, it was as a result, sorry, and he was as a result rendered lame. Yaakov then had the face-to-face confrontation with his brother Eitzav. And as I'm going through these, think of these things. These are the things that have happened over 20 years of history. Think of your life 20 years ago and think whether events like this have happened with regularity in your life. Events that you can uh, say were comparable with these things anyway because Yehovah molded us all in exactly the same way. And Shechem, his only daughter, Dina, was raped. Through the vengeance of his two sons, Yaakov's name was debased. At Beit El, his mother's nursemaid, the Devoah, died. Uh, near Beit Lachem, his beloved wife, Rachel, died while giving birth to his youngest, the Binyamin. Yaakov's eldest son, Reuven, dishonored his father by sleeping with Bilha. Shortly after his return home to Be'er Shava, uh, Yitzhak died. So we have all experienced things, the, the loss of people, terrible things that have happened in our life. But it brought Yaakov to a place um, and hopefully it will bring us to a place of faith with uh, Yehovah as well. Let's pray.